Good morning, everyone. Let me welcome to this uh, webinar. Who speaking is uh, Francesco Bosello. I'm an uh, associate professor of economics uh, at the University of Milan at the Department of Environmental Sciences and Policy. I'm also senior researcher at the Euro Mediterranean Center on Climate Change. And uh, finally, I'm the coordinator of the COACH project. Welcome to this uh, webinar, which is uh, which belongs to the series of uh, CMCC webinars, and in particular is the opening of uh, one, the first out of four webinars related to the results uh, uh, produced by this coach project. So let me welcome. Uh, I'm very glad to see how many participants are interested in this uh, in this in this topic and this is encouraging also in these times of uh, let's say troubles and the health emergency i think that uh, is important to have uh, an environmental and climate change awareness uh, still uh, still high so uh, two words uh, really about uh, the coach project this is an horizon 2020 research project lasting uh, uh, three years and a half. It is more or less two years old. And now we are producing, uh, we are able to produce the first uh, research results from this project. The major um, focus and the novelty of COACH is to uh, improve the knowledge about uh, and the economic quantification of climate change impacts uh, with a focus on regional asymmetries uh, induced by climate change impacts. This is one issue. The other novelty of the project is trying to uh, understand which are so-called tipping points, social economic tipping points. So situation of uh, uh, particularly huge and non-linear damages affecting social economic system, systems against trying to identify, especially in Europe, where these tipping points or hotspots are. So um, <clears throat> before uh, giving the floor to the chairman of this uh, um, webinar and also to the speaker, of course, let me also very briefly uh, introduce, say two words about the Euro Mediterranean Center on Climate Change. It is a multidisciplinary research center based in Italy with the main aim to study climate change impacts and also solutions. So therefore policies trying to put this in the broader context of sustainability and sustainable development in order to give support to policy making, of course, advancing research and also supporting private private action. Uh, CNCC is a, a multidisciplinary research center and also multi-office research center, so it's spread all over, all over uh, Italy, has been founded in 2005 and in 2015 has become uh, um, a research foundation. It is actually found, um, composed by seven members the National Institute of Ge Geophysics and Vulcanology, the University of Salento, the Italian Aerospace Center, Kafoska University of Venice, the U University of Tuscia, the University of Sassari, and the Politecnico of Milan. So it is a, mi a mix of uh, research institution and academic, and, uh, academic uh, institution is composed by nine research division, nine departments, each, of, each uh, more or less uh, composed by 20 to 30 researchers. Uh, each, uh, and you can see how uh, it encompasses all the different uh, disciplines as much as possible um, that are related to climate change science, from climatology to social economic uh, sciences basically and uh, the research is organized across uh, these uh, nine research topics that as you see tries to uh, embed or nest the climate change issue in uh, its uh, broader relevance for uh, um, uh, societal uh, societal development 
uh, in addition to research, CMCC is uh, developing a lot of uh, outreach activities. These uh, webinars uh, are just one of the initiatives in this direction, but in addition to scientific publication, that we have also educational and communication uh, activities that you are very welcome to uh, investigate more on this uh, uh, visiting our, our uh, website. So let me just say that um, people who are participating to this uh, webinar are very welcome to raise questions. And to do this, you have to write questions and a moderator will select them and put direct them to the relevant uh, to the relevant uh, speakers basically uh, let me also say that uh, the webinar will be recorded so you could uh, find it uh, and revisit it afterwards in our uh, website and finally very final point uh, let me say that uh, as uh, anticipated, this is, this is just the first webinar related to um, coach research activity. Uh, the next one is already planned for May 14. So you are, if you are happy with this one, you are very welcome to also uh, apply and participate to the next one. Hopefully you will be as numerous as uh, you are today or even more. With this said, I finish my introductory speech and I'm very glad to uh, give the floor to um, Paul Watkins, which is uh, the chairman and moderator of this webinar and it is also uh, part of the, the coach uh, uh, research team and in particular is uh, um, responsible for the huge stakeholder engagement uh, that uh, we uh, developed within within the project. So, Paul, the floor is yours, and I'm just stop sharing the screen and mute my microphone as well. Okay, thank you, Francesco. Good morning. Uh, welcome to all our participants. This is the first uh, webinar that we are uh, produced on the Coach project. So, uh, if there are any uh, complications, we apologize in advance. What we have for you this morning is two really interesting presentations. So some really uh, fascinating early results from the COACH project, which is looking at the economic costs of climate change in Europe. Uh, and the way that we would like to run this is we will have one presentation on agriculture and um, forestry and fisheries from uh, Esther and Benjamin. Uh, and then we'll have a little bit of time for some quick questions after that. Um, and then we'll go to a second presentation on coastal impacts from Daniel. And again, we'll have uh, a few questions after that, and that will hopefully get us through the time about right. And then there'll be an opportunity after that uh, for some extra questions if people want to extend for a little bit longer. Um, so uh, uh, without that, and because we have a lot to get through, I'm gonna pass across to Esther to kick us off uh, with some really great results on the agricultural sector that we want to share with you. Okay, Esther, over to you, please. Uh, thanks very much for the introduction, Paul. Um, so I will, um, I will give you a brief overview of what have been, what we have been doing so far in the. Um, apologies. Um, in in the. Uh, agriculture, forestry, and fisheries sector. Um, and if okay, I have shared my screen new, now with you. Uh, this um, uh, analysis has been done partly by IASA and partly by uh, the uh, by PIC. Um, and uh, I will focus here mostly on the results that have been taken place so far by IASA. Um, together uh, conducted by myself um, as well as by Hugo Valle, um, who is in the audience here. Um, so, um, so what do we... Oops. 
I'm very sorry. Okay, so <laughs> sorry for that. Um, uh, what do we know about climate change and agriculture? Climate change has the potential to affect the agriculture, forestry and fisheries sector, both negatively uh, from lower rainfall, increasing variability and extreme heat, uh, as well as positively. So, for example, from increased for, uh, CO2 fertilization and extended seasons. Um, and this may result in um, in impacts uh, from gradual climate change and extreme events, uh, but also in indi more indirect impacts, for example, due to pests and diseases. Uh, in turn, this may affect productivity and production, consumption, prices, trade and land use. Um, this climate research analysis has so far often been very spe sector specific. So focusing on one specific sector, for example, agriculture or the forestry sector um, without it using an, a more integrated approach. Uh, and it's also focused so far uh, very often on long-term changes. In COACH, we try to provide uh, a consistent pic picture of uh, the agriculture, forestry and fisheries sector, uh, as well as uh, mostly focusing on Europe and doing so as the spatially explicit nuts to level. Um, so what we know from the from the literature so far is that there is a range of or a scala of possibilities uh, that influence the impact that the agriculture, forestry, and fishery sector will uh, find on of climate change. Um, so on the left of the screen, you can find the uncertainty um, on future drivers um, such as. Uh, how much more warming do we ex actually expe uh, expect? For this, we have um, the RCP scenarios, such as they were developed in the IPCC fifth assessment report. These range from uh, usually from RCP 2.6, which uh, assumes a low level of warming, to uh, 8.5, where the level of warming is very high. Um, at the same time, um, there uh, are questions about the uh, future economy. So uh, how much will there be uh, demanded? What is the population grow growth and how sustainable will the future be? Um, for this, um, <clears throat> we use the so-called social economic pathways, the SSPs. Um, especially uh, what is especially Important also for the agricultural sector is the reaction to warming, so um, on plants. So the CO2 fertilization that is attached to these different uh, RCPs uh, will react differently for different plants. And this will in fact in, ter in turn um, impact their productivity. <clears throat> and to the degree to which is quite uncertain. Uh, on the right of the screen, you can see the uncertainty in the modeling and the, the systems reaction. Uh, so there are different GCMs, uh, uh, global climate models, that all um, have different um, reactions of climate to temperature and, for example, precipitation. In order to... Um, to give meaning to these un uncertainties, we have developed a um, integrated assessment framework um, to analyze eventually the impacts on and the costs of climate change on the agriculture, forestry and fisheries sectors. For this, we start uh, by using uh, global uh, general circulation models, GCMs. We try to use the best available data, so the Eurocodex data, where the temperature and precipitation uh, they, um, numbers feed into biophysical models. There are various biophysical models used, uh, such as crop models, uh, forestry models, and uh, forest fire models, uh, which in turn give the impact of uh, productivity changes on uh, bioeconomic models. Two bioeconomics models are used in this project, uh, Globium EU and MAGPI. <laughs> Bioeconomic models are di directly in, um, impacted uh, by um, SSP and mitigation um, changes in order to uh, give a range of the, the costs of climate change as well as the area consumption and land use change. 
I will now go through um, the, these results in terms of what you can expect from climate change, uh, from the gradual climate change in terms of the biophysical uh, part, the economic part, and the integrated part. Uh, for this, I will focus on the models we use at IASA, uh, which is Globium um, and, uh, and biophysical models, uh, EPIC, GFORM, and FLAM. Um, <clears throat> Later on, my uh, colleague uh, from PIC, uh, Be Benjamin Bodersky, will also give some introduction into Magpie. For the biophysical impact, we have seen, uh, we can see that uh, we have used the, the uh, model, <coughs> the process-based biophysical model EPIC uh, to assess the main global agricultural systems in response to management interventions. So this can be uh, irrigation or, uh, for example, fertilizer change under a changing environment, uh, which is in this case different degrees of climate change. Um, the four figures below here show um, the impact of climate change on wheat and corn for different levels of warming. Uh, so in, case, in this case on the left for an RCP 4.5 and an RCP 8.5 scenario. We, uh, two striking features here are that um, the impacts on wheat um, are far less significant than the impacts on corn. This has to do with the fact that wheat is a C3 crop, uh, which adapts better to CO2 fertilization, as we call it, so the degree of warming. Um, and corn is a so-called C4 crop, crop. If we turn to RCP 8.5, we can see that the um, uh, the effects are becoming more negative, especially in the south, but um, that this line keeps going up to the north as well. With regard to forestry, we use the global forest model G4M to assess the change in biomass accumulation. Um, <clears throat> And this is based on radi uh, radiation and temperature changes and uh, the forest growth, so the, the annual increment and the, uh, the biomass are assessed. Um, here we can see that especially under uh, HEADCAM 8.5 scenario, so an RCP 8.5 scenario, especially towards a longer time horizon, impacts start to become negative in the southern part of Europe. Uh, northern parts of Europe, especially in the Finland, in the, <coughs> in the uh, short term, are um, having some positive gains through, um, uh, uh, through global warming. The second uh, impact of forests, uh, of climate change on forests, uh, can be uh, uh, perceived through the enhanced risk of forest fires. For this, we use the wildfire uh, climate impact model, the FLAM model, which uses um, the climate impact data as well as population um, to, uh, as well as population changes to see how the, the burned areas will enhance. Especially in European forests and especially in Mediterranean European forests, these effects might triple uh, by, 20, uh, by the end of the century and then especially in the highest warming scenario in RCP 8.5. <laughs> For fisheries, we use um, two, uh, two uh, a range of RCP scenarios, RCP 2.6 and 8.5, and two uh, fisheries uh, production uh, potential or catch potential models, the DFSFM model and the, the BDEM model, to uh, um, assess the, the, pro the projected difference in change uh, of on catch potential. Especially here on, under the DBEM model, we can see that, as, uh, that in uh, a high warming scenario, um, in the, nor in the uh, tropics, where, um, this has a, negative, um, a large negative effect on catch potential, whereas in the northern hemisphere, um, this might have a positive uh, effect. So moving from these uh, biophysical impacts towards more economic impacts, um, I will show you the effects on agriculture, forestry, and fisheries separately of um, consumption, production, uh, and land use change, amongst others. 
<coughs> for this, we used uh, the partial equilibrium model Globium, um, where the production changes feed into, um, so the, the climate-induced production changes feed into uh, this model. Um, this happens for the, for the forestry sector, for the agricultural sector, and for the fishery sectors in an integrated way. Um, in addition, we have the, the socio-economic uh, scenarios that uh, influence uh, population, consumer pre preferences, and GDP. Uh, these come together at the level of the markets. In this case, this is the, in the, for Europe, um, the level of national um, uh, countries uh, at the country level. Um, and this then influences the prices, which in turn influences demand and production um, and drives uh, land use change. From this, um, economic indicators such as costs, as well as environmental indicators such as um, bio uh, biodiversity uh, can be calculated. <coughs> In terms of the agricultural sector, um, we see that the economic impacts for agriculture uh, are estimated in area, production and consumption. Uh, under CO2 fertilization, positive effects of climate change on wheat are observed. Uh, for corn, however, this is the other way around. And this is, has to do with the CO2 um, fertilization effects of the specific crops that I mentioned before. Generally, uh, this effect holds along the axis of the different economic scenarios. Um, whereas, especially the SSP4 scenarios were divided, world performs worse. However, we also find that uh, the climate models have a huge impact uh, in terms of the impacts on the economic situation um, that climate change enforces. Um, secondly, um, there are high uh, regionally distributed effects. For example, for corn, we can see that the yellow bars here represent that in the south of Europe, the larger losses, much larger losses are experienced than in the Central East or in the West of Europe. There is some adaptation in, this, uh, in these models. For example, in the case of corn, we can see that area increases somewhat to compensate for the uh, negative effect of um, climate change on the productivity of corn. However, this is not enough to compensate, um, especially in uh, the high warming scenarios of RCP 8.5. If we move on to forestry, we can see that the, the biomass um, changes, um, we can analyze the biomass changes through the managed forest areas, as well as through the production and consumption of sawnwood and wood pulp. Um, the largest effects are found for a, in, in terms of in a higher time, time zone, so in 2017 under RCP 8.5. Um, here, the managed forest area increases in Europe uh, to compensate for the losses that we have seen in the biophysical models before. However, uh, this is not enough um, to compensate for the loss of production of especially sunwood and wood pulp. Again, here we would see um, highly differentiated impacts um, in, in terms of compared to a no climate change uh, scenario, with especially losses in the western part of Europe. Um, when we move to the fishery sectors, uh, we can see that fisheries can, um, that the effect of the economic effect of fisheries on Europe might not be as high as expect, ex, expected um, from what we have seen in uh, the biophysical models. And one interesting finding here is that fish stocks can migrate and due to this they might actually move up um, and therefore have a, a not so negative effect on Europe as in other parts of the world. 
Um, however, the fishery sector is highly intimately connected to the other sectors, to agriculture and forestry, uh, through feed, uh, sorry, not to, through forestry, uh, uh, through feed markets. So capture fisheries are therefore the primary source of fish meal and fish oil, which are ingredients for farmed fish and therefore also uh, not only the a catch potential, but all or the actually cut amount in oceans, but also the total amount of agriculture production decreases. Um, as said, though, this effect uh, is in is observed in Europe not as strongly as in the rest of the world. Um, so, um, although RCP 8.5 shows the strongest effects globally, we find that in Europe, as per all already with lower degrees of warming, this might already have uh, a large impact in Europe and that the degree of warming doesn't depend so much on the total losses perceived in Europe. <coughs> Moving to the integrated impacts, we um, one of the key uh, ass assignments in COACH is to um, quantify the costs of climate change. So we have done this uh, for the agriculture, forestry and fishery se uh, sectors uh, separately as well as totally. Uh, for agriculture, we find uh, a loss of um, in the in the middle of the road RCP scenario uh, of RCP 4.5 of 1.3 billion euros. Um, this is for livestock and crop uh, production combined. Uh, for crop production alone, this would be around 600 million euros. Uh, on the forestry sector, uh, we find around 870 million euros, euros, and on the fishery se sector, this is around 600 million euros. <clears throat> One important finding, especially for the forestry sector, is that um, under RCP 8.5, uh, fire protection uh, efforts could triple uh, and therefore add a significant um, cost of almost 4 billion euros in addition due to forest drying and high mortality of rates. Um, for especially higher RCP scenarios, we also find a regional distribution effect where especially losses are observed in the southern part of uh, Europe and in the eastern, central eastern part of Europe. Um, these losses, though, uh, may lead to uh, environmental impacts, to reversed environmental impacts. Um, this may mean that, for example, here in uh, Spain, you can find um, a, a retraction of the area of cropland and forest land um, uh, to the benefit of grassland and natural land. And this may mean um, that um, emissions, in, especially in these countries, can increase. So, uh, sorry, can decrease and therefore um, positive environmental impacts can be found. Uh, this is especially found in southern uh, European countries, as well as in Finland, where uh, the, forest, uh, uh, the forest land is doing uh, relatively better, better under a, a medium uh, RCP scenario. Uh, Esther, are you, can you go to the conclusion soon, please? Yes, so I'm here at the conclusion slide. Um, so what do we find uh, to bring this on to a conclusion is that the agriculture, for agriculture, the magnitude of climate-induced yield impact highly differs between either a C3 or a C4 crop. So, for example, between corn and wheat. So the biophysical impact is highly important. Largest losses are found in the southern and east, central eastern part uh, of European countries. Uh, and in these areas, land reallocations are expected from the southern part to uh, the northern parts of Europe. Um, these findings are fairly robust um, towards different RC RCP and SSP scenarios, but this is less so for different GCMs and the effect of CO2 fertilization. Uh, for the forestry sector, we find a reduction in biomass, especially in high uh, warming scenarios. Um, this might be positive for uh, some northern European countries, such as Finland, um, but on this, uh, the, uh, the maybe largest threat for the forestry sector is the increase in burned area that is expected, especially in the Mediterranean countries. 
for fisheries, we find a large decline in capture catches globally. Um, however, because of the mobility of the fish stocks, uh, this effect may be mitigated in, in Europe compared to other uh, non-EU member states. Um, so this is in a nutshell uh, the results from the agriculture, forestry and fisheries sector. If you would have, um, if you would like to further read into these results, they are described uh, and they uploaded in the deliverable 2.2 impacts on agriculture, forestry and fisheries on the COACH website. Thank you very much. Uh, I would now hand over to Benjamin Bodirski for some uh, reflection on this. Yes, um, thank you very much. Can you see my screen? Um, I hope you yes, can see my screen. Yes, we yeah? can. Okay. Um, so, uh, in my five minutes add on to Esther's presentation, um, I actually don't want to go into further model results from uh, Magpie, but I would rather share some, uh, some general insights, some meta insights, and I would like to speak a bit about uncertainty. Um, about the role of adaptation and about also the difficulties in making um, uh, agroeconomic um, uh, or regional level agroeconomic projections. And let's first come to the role of uncertainty. As Esther showed, the results are the result of a whole model chain. So we have um, uh, climate models combined with um, uh, crop models and then these crop models are combined with agroeconomic um, uh, models of the um, agricultural sector, or in the case, in this case, also even of forestry and agriculture and fishery. And within these, this model chain, of course, also the uncertainties add up. So we start off with, um, yeah, I would say pretty robust projections, how much the global mean temperature rises with uh, global warming. And then um, uh, the first um, level where a lot of uncertainty comes in is when these global temperatures are then uh, translated into regional patterns. Um, uh, so with the temperature, that's one thing. With the precipitation, that's even more difficult. So um, we have already a rather high uncertainty in the regional precipitation patterns for long-term uh, projections. And then um, uh, these um, temperature and precipitation patterns, they enter the crop yields, uh, cro the, the crop models. And in the crop models, of course, we also have further uncertainties, for example, connected to the effect of CO2 fertilization that Esther already mentioned, but also to other things. For example, crop models so far are not very good at uh, representing extreme events. Um, they are not very good at representing the individual phenological state states of the plant and then if extreme events happen for example during a certain phase like the emphasis of a, a plant where it flowers um, uh, this can have very strong impacts that are yet not possible to represent in global global crop models and then the next step is that these biophysical models enter the socio-economic models and um, you have to see that the, the climate change will not hit the, so much uh, the current agriculture, but more, much more the future agriculture. So we actually have to look or have to put it into a context of a world in the year, for example, in the year 2050, where, of course, economic growth has changed uh, as well. Population growth will have increased and there are large uncertainties also concerning the policy, policy conditions, trade agreements, etc. Um, and then when you have such a global model, the last step to look at regional patterns is of course the most difficult because here really in this global interconnected food supply, food system, um, really every world region competes with all other world regions for the most um, cost efficient production places. And um, uh, these patterns are extremely difficult to, to project as I will illustrate in a moment. Um, and yeah, we focused a lot on this, on the, the, the role of adaptation within the system and that happens at different stages. So first of all, you have some, some adaptation that happens after the harvest. So you can buffer wrong, uh, bad harvest through storage. 
through regional pooling. That means if one part of Germany had bad harvests and another one good, these two cancel out. But also through global pooling, through international trade, you can substitute, you can also reduce uh, the demand at, at the end if no other option is there. So, so feed demand, for example, is to a certain degree flexible to, to react. Um, uh, and then next to this post-harvest adaptation, you also have pre-harvest adaptation. So you can change the area or you can also intensify the yield. This is of course something that you can only do when you anticipate the, the, the climate change impacts. And if you then, for example, in the next year, change your behavior accordingly. Um, yeah, and through this adaptation, we can clearly say that the biophysical outcome is not the, the final product, but it will be mostly reduced through adaptation. Um, but this outcome after adaptation um, can be very different. And here, the really the relative competitiveness of the different um, regions is key. So for example, if in one a European region, the biophysical impact say that the yields go down, this does not necessarily mean that production actually has to go down. For example, it can be that in all other European regions, the yields go down even further, so that the region which is the, the least affected will actually see increase in production because it, it has a relative competitive uh, advantage. And the same is um, true for international markets. And finally, the same is also true within the same region. So for example, if for example, crop yields of temperate cereals improve in Germany, but rapeseed yields improve even more. This could mean that temperate cereals are declining even though they had positive biophysical impacts. So you see that the, the, the dynamics are very complex and um, uh, it's also very difficult to, to project these yet. Um, uh, just one example here um, uh, where you can see that they, they might be rather unintuitive here, for example, because of climate impacts, in this case, the climate impacts were positive due to, to um, CO2 fertilization. The positive impacts did actually get reinforced in Eastern European Union because um, uh, it got so attractive for production that additionally to the positive impacts, we saw an area expansion and we saw further intensification of these areas because they were so competitive. Um, uh, while in other regions it might be maybe the reverse, where basically uh, because the positive yield effects, um, the area is reduced and rather given to a different crop. Um, uh, coming to the conclusions, we really see very high uncertainties uh, at this stage and also a need to, to work further on, on this um, model chain. However, it's needed, of course, because we need to know what's the, the, in the end the economic effects. Um, that the role of adaptation is really key and um, in reducing the biophysical impacts, but also that we are not yet, or at least on the Magpie side, um, we still have um, difficulties in representing this adaptation behavior well. And we assume that our, our assumptions are likely overly optimistic uh, when it comes to, to um, the adaptation behavior. And finally, um, one finding that I clearly had was that, uh, that it's extremely difficult to make regional projections because um, relative competitiveness is so important and the global markets are so interconnected. Thanks a lot. Thank you uh, very much, Esther and Benjamin. Um, that was incredibly interesting. We have lots of questions, but what we are going to propose to do is to go straight to Daniel's talk to make sure that we do have the opportunity to get the content across in the first hour and then if people who are interested can stay um, we'll go through the questions and answer. So, so Daniel can I ask you to um, take over and present your slides on the coastal sector please. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I was muted, but now I'm unmuted. Yeah, my name is 
my name is Daniel Inke from Global Climate Forum in Berlin, and I'm working on impacts, climate change impacts in coastal areas, and I will present some results from Coach on this, and I will try to hurry um, as we are bit uh, short in time. Um, yeah, coastal areas are places which are highly populated because it's nice to live there and they also have a lot of economic activities. So uh, it's worth to look at them. Um, in my uh, result presentation here, I will uh, focus on the European results because coach is a European project and the European Union has about 65,000 kilometers of coastline. Um, we access the following um, impacts within our assessments. It's coastal flooding, that's erosion of uh, beaches and uh, Land and wetland change. This is the loss or gain of things like marshes and uh, uh, globally also mangroves, but not in Europe. There are no, not much or not any mangroves in Europe. In addition, in coach for the first time, we looked at coastal migration as a uh, effect of sea level rise and increased flooding, and we present the uh, Besides on NUTS 2 level, which we also have not done before, coach. And um, yeah, uh, for assessing sea level rise um, impacts, we need to have sea level rise scenarios. And in uh, addition to other sectors, we have another. Uh, dimension of uncertainty when we look at sea level rise scenarios. Sea level rise scenarios uh, are not only, do not only depend on the climate model and on the RCP, but also on um, assumptions on ice sheet melting. So there are basically two big land ice sheets, which is the Antarctic ice sheet and the Greenland ice sheet. And even if you fix your climate model and your RCP, the, and there's huge uncertainty about how these ice sheets will react. Uh, we see this here, for instance, in the RCP uh, 8.5, the Antarctica, there we have a lower bound, which is the 5% probability in a way of two centimeter, but the upper bound of uh, uh, 41 centimeters of sea level rise until 2100. And to capture this in the, uh, in the sea level rise scenarios, we just fixed one GCM, the Hadley Center GCM, the first one in line, and we interpret the low and high climate uncertainty more as these uh, uncertainty ranges of the, the ice sheets. In addition, we look at the high-end scenario, high-end sea level rise scenario in order to capture the unlikely but not impossible case of a very fast and very high sea level rise. So this is what we get. Um, as you see here, oops, sorry. Um, the sea level rise, coastal mean sea level rise over time and the blue ones are the RCP 2.6s and the purple one is the really high end scenario and as you see we can end up with something like like 25 centimeters or 30 centimeters in the very low cases and the high end scenario goes up to 1.7 meters in of sea level rise in 2100 compared to uh, nowadays so this would be a huge thing Mm -hmm. Sorry. Ah. A short, um, a few short words to the methods we used. Our model, which is called the DIVA model, that does not appear here, fortunately. Um, it works like this. We look at the coast and we look at a lot of data on coastal areas and we cut the coastline into pieces wherever a uh, 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 piece of the coast 
is very similar in terms of biophysical and social economic characteristics. So we end up with these pieces of the coach, which are of different uh, of the coast, which are of different length, and globally we end up with about 12,000 of these segments, in average uh, 70 kilometers long. The European Union has about 2,500 of these segments. For each of these segments, there is a model of the coastal plain behind. So, and uh, this is quite simple. This is the coastal plain here, and you see we collect data about the population and the infrastructure which is in this uh, coastal plain and we also collect data on which elevation this uh, population and infrastructure is located and then we have uh, data on extreme water levels these are the ages here and you see the the very Upper one is the age 1000, which means this is the water level, which is there uh, once every thousand, which can be expected once every thousand years. And we look in these, in our model explicitly at protection and adaptation. So what you see here, this gray thing is a protection measure, something like a dike or a seawall. And this holds back extreme water levels, which are below the high of the thing. So in this example here, the H10 would not be flood, would not flood anything because it would be held back by the uh, protection measure and the H100 would flood the thing. And with this simple model, we are able to calculate something like expected damages and that's what we have done also in coach in the uh, coastal areas with a focus on European Union and uh, first thing to note is that the European or Europe is not the main contributor of global uh, impacts on coastal areas uh, here on the left you see in the no adaptation case, um, the, the global sites and here on, on the right, the, the European sites and you see it's only a very small proportion of the coastal, of the global sites and the main contribution on the global accumulation comes from the South, Southeast and East Asian coasts where there are a lot of very flat lands with high population. Um, now we zoom in into this European um, panel and these are European results now and uh, very important takeaway message from the coastal areas is always that if we are successful in adapting that means in raising the dikes as sea level um, rises um, we can really lower the impacts by several orders of magnitude. So on the left hand, you see the panels with results, um, protection costs on the other one and uh, sea flood costs on the lower ones. Um, on the left without adaptation and there the assumption is we don't raise any dikes any more than the existing ones. So we freeze all dikes in 2015 and then the impacts, uh, especially with high sea level rise scenarios and especially towards the end of the century get really, really huge. Um, I have here one number, the Hurricane Sandy in 2012 in the US uh, was about 70 billion US dollar. So without adaptation and a very high, uh, sea level wise it could be like hundreds of sandies each year at year at the end of the century only in Europe. However, if we are successful with adapt adaptation here on the right hand, uh, then you see it almost disappears. Um, so impacts are several orders of magnitudes, at least three lower than 
if we do not adapt. And in the upper panel here, we see the, the adaptation costs would not be that high. Uh, they would be much smaller than the costs that we avoid, that avoided damages. So if we look at uh, country level results for the European Union again, um, we see, and that's also something which is in a way clear, the most affected countries are in Northwest Europe, so Belgium, Germany, France, uh, the UK and the Netherlands, and Italy as the only Mediterranean country. And uh, yeah, here you see again, with successful adaptation, we can lower these costs quite a bit. And uh, if you look at the numbers here, you see that the uh, adaptation costs are two orders of magnitudes below the, the potential damages. So adaptation really um, pays off. Um, for coach, we at the first time looked at NUTS 2 level units, and this is a list of the most affected NUTS 2 level units. It's under the RCP 8.5, so sorted after these impacts and uh, in 2100 with no adaptation. So if somebody of you lives in one of these red or orange uh, areas, don't panic, it's without adaptation. And uh, we see again this uh, uh, local distribution. Interesting in the case of Italy is that in the case of Italy, most of the national impacts come from this north east area, uh, namely from the Veneto region. And I now show you a bit the coastal areas of the three most uh, infect, uh, affected NUTS 2 units. So that's the the Veneto region, uh, the red one is the, the NUTS 2 unit and the green to yellow one is the elevation of the coastal area and the greener it is, the lower is the elevation. So dark green is zero or below and the yellow ones here are then 10 meters and here in the middle is the city of Venice and you see uh, the, whole, the whole administrative unit has a lot of low-lying uh, areas, uh, mainly rural areas, where it will be difficult to protect them on uh, sufficient levels, probably. And these are the two, uh, the second and the third one, affected ones, these are in the UK, and you also see that it's uh, mainly rural area with uh, huge coastal plains and uh, huge low-lying lands. Finally, we looked at uh, land loss and coastal migration the first time, and these are results uh, accumulated over for, uh, the complete 21st century. And you see the highest migration numbers and the highest land loss is again in the countries where we also have the highest impact. So the, the North West European North Sea Coast kind of countries. And uh, yeah, but also one of the conclusions is that uh, coastal migration is also not a, a major problem probably in Europe. I mean, these are accumulated numbers and even under the high sea level rise scenarios, we do not estimate more than yeah, 30,000 people in the single countries to migrate over the 21st century. This looks much worse in other parts of the world, uh, again in Southeast Asia especially. Um, instead of conclusions, I have a little outlook uh, what we do with these results. Um, um, next steps will be within the coach project to fit them into the economic models and to um, yeah, do economy, economy-wide effects within European country and uh, see how these uh, coastal impacts contribute. 
and we will also inform the assessment uh, or, or the analysis of these socioeconomic tipping points. There will probably be other webinars looking at these results in the future, so stay tuned and uh, you will get uh, informed. And we also have a deliverable, I don't have it here, but if you go uh, to the link ESA just presented, there will be a deliverable 2.3. This is the coastal uh, impacts, which also has a part on river flooding, but the time was too short to present river flooding here. So I'm finished now and would hand over again to Paul. <laughs> Thank you ever so much, Daniel. Uh, um, so that is um, the two presentations that's taken us across our initial hour slot. So uh, that was um, important for us to sort of get the presentations through in the time period. Um, we understand many of you are busy and so we'll um, drop off now. But for what we're going to do now, for those who have a little bit more time, is ask a few questions. Um, there's one question that I can answer, which is, will the slides be available? Uh, someone has asked after the webinar, and that's an easy yes. So the slides will be, be will be made available. Um, we have about 200 people on the on the on this uh, on this event, so we can't ask all the questions. Um, so as moderator, I have to sort of pick a few, and I can pick them on the basis of who asked the first question, or the questions I like best, or just randomly. And I'll do a little bit of a combination of those. So uh, what I will do is just ask um, a couple of questions first to our first speakers uh, and then they can respond and then um, as the questions come in for Daniel I'll ask him a couple more questions and we'll probably do this for about 15 minutes for people who are still interested but we will then pass all your questions over to the speakers as well. Um, so we have a couple of questions now so I'm going to start with two questions for Esther and one for Benjamin. So one question, um, and I'm not quite sure of protocol about whether I should say who these are from or not, but um, Esther, two, quest two questions for you. One is um, just around why the area of corn expands when yields decline, and our uh, questioner has asked, um, uh, wouldn't a profit maximizer produce uh, and switch towards less sensitive crops? So to get a little bit more about the mechanism there. And then also, I think it would be great if you could um, say something about on one of your slides. Um, there was uh, some losses shown for fisheries under RCP 8.5, but agriculture was for 4.5. And I suspect the answer to that is it's in the deliverable, but it would be good just to get a clarification on that. And then, Benjamin, maybe I can ask you a question, which is um, around the um, pre-harvest adaptation measures that you uh, mentioned and to get some more explanation on those. So if we take those three questions first and then I'll see where we are after that in terms of timing and additional questions. Okay, thanks very much. Um, so first to the first question about uh, the yield decline and area expansion. Um, this is a result from uh, the model that I showed in the economic uh, impact uh, assessment, so uh, Globium and its a partial equilibrium model, where um, I try to very briefly con uh, say the uh, tell you about the mechanisms of the model. Um, so from the bottom up, you have then uh, uh, the, uh, so from the bottom up, you have then uh, the change in the productivity in this in this sense a decline in the yield. However, this is matched uh, by uh, various um, uh, economic drivers, and these economic drivers are, uh, for example, uh, demand based on population growth of, or changes in diets. Um, this means that whenever uh, through this market interaction, you may have a decrease in the yield. Um, however, this this may mean uh, that the price of the production uh, the, of the product actually goes up, and therefore um, the the agricultural losses are not as high as just uh, the the loss in productivity times a fixed price. Um, so there is a, a an optimization procedure where uh, the new equilibrium between demand and supply has. Uh, has to be found. Um, 
and this leads to uh, a change in the area allocation due to the increase in price, uh, which is fueled by this increase in demand. Uh, that is actually um, a uh, like changing the area allocation up till the uh, the, the production uh, up till the extra unit of production is not profitable, uh, profitable anymore or not as profitable as indeed cultivating another crop. So there is a uh, reallocation of area, but not enough to compensate the change in production. Um, for the second question, with regard to the RCPs, um, yes, um, this is uh, true that you can find more RCPs. Uh, so I had to make a selection, pre-selection in the presentation given the, the time. Um, for agriculture and uh, forestries, if you would look into uh, the deliverable, uh, you could see that it's done throughout the entire RCP um, matrix from 2.6 all the way through 8.5, whereas 4.5 4 is sort of like uh, the, the benchmark RCP that we used in COACH. Um, the fishery sector is a bit um, scientific, in the scientific literature, um, a bit less developed, I would say, than agriculture and forestries. Um, and therefore, uh, we have to rely a lot about what has been currently estimated in, in in the literature and so far uh, this has been 2.6 and uh, 8.5 so it will give you sort of the the range of the scenarios from which uh, for example uh, 4.5 could be interpolated but it has not been estimated yet using biophysical models i hope that answered uh, the first two questions Yes, yeah, is Benjamin left already? Or I know Benjamin had to leave at some point. Benjamin, are no, you still there? I'm still there. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So I've also been asked to um, uh, ask tell people who the question was from. Um, so that's fine. I can do that. The box tells me what the people's name is. It doesn't tell me how to pronounce them. So I may <laughs> not pronounce your names very correctly. But um, so uh, Sachini Patrana asked the question about what types of adaptation methods Oh, no, sorry, that's for the for the, for the, the coastal one. This was for the um, what type of adaptation, uh, pre-harvest adaptation measures are shown, and that was from Antonio Grathi. Okay, so the, the, answering the question, which type of pre-harvest adaptation measures measures were shown? Um, maybe the, the wording was not the best. It's not it's not so much pre-harvest, but it's actually pre-seeding, uh, so pre-planting uh, adaptation. So this basically says that anticipating that there will be climate impacts, you already start growing a different crop. So for example, you, you choose a different uh, crop variety or you, you choose um, a different also area that you, you will cultivate. Um, uh, so this is basically done just uh, before seeding and then you basically have two decisions um, uh, of intensification. One is basically during the, the cultivation, um, how how intensive do you cultivate, um, uh, cultivate it? What's the, the, the target yield? But on the other hand, there's also actually an anticipation that starts much earlier, which is um, in terms of, of uh, crop breeding. So crop breeding usually takes something like uh, 15 years in advance and they are also, of course, they are looking at how will conditions change in the future and then they are, for example, breeding more drought resistant crops. Um, and then the question is, right, how, how well will this anticipation happen? And um, uh, if this anticipation works fine, then it's basically an adaptation to the, to the crop uh, climate impacts. Yeah, maybe that's as an answer. Great. Okay. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to move across to two questions for Daniel. Um, so, Daniel, uh, the first question is, um, uh, what type of adaptation methods are found to be effective in reducing coastal flooding? And that's from Sachini Pathrana. And then we also have a question from Eline Vanusrecht, which is, uh, Belgium is amongst the most affected areas, but it uh, has very low numbers for land loss and migration. And why is that? Have you got your microphone on, Jano? Yeah. 
here I am. Sorry, I was muted by the moderator and then also the moderator can only unmute me, so I couldn't unmute myself. Um, yeah, thank you for the both questions, for the two questions. Uh, first one, what uh, adaptation measures are fine to be effective? Uh, it's clearly uh, coastal protection by hard structural measures, that means dikes, seawalls, things like this. Um, other measures, adaptation measures we look at is uh, uh, nourishment, beach nourishment uh, for uh, erosion. So if your sandy coast uh, erodes, the sand is washed away, you just put new sand on it. Uh, this is also done uh, in uh, large scales around the world and uh, this is also quite effective but if it really comes to densely populated um, low-lying lands with high uh, extreme water level events then the most effective uh, way to protect this are uh, hard structural measures there are also these uh, nature-based solutions that you do something like dunes or so, but uh, if you have really uh, high populated low-lying lands, uh, then there probably needs to be some hard structural measures and dike from things like concrete or so um, as the core of an adaptation solution to such a system. The second question was about Belgium and uh, I did not really uh, mention, uh, because I was short of time, uh, how this works in the modeling with the land loss and the migration. Land can only be lost or people only migrate from land which is lost and lo land can only be lost if it's not protected. So in a situation where you have a dike, then no land is lost. Uh, as long as the dike is there. And especially in Belgium, we have a quite short coastline uh, and, a, uh, and a big coastal plain, which is uh, densely populated with uh, cities like Antwerpen and so on. Um, so that means this will likely be protected. So that means we actually don't have any, I think, uh, land loss and migration in Belgium. Nevertheless, we have impacts. Uh, if you have protection, there will be at events at some points who uh, overtop the existing protection and then you still have uh, impacts. But this is something, uh, yeah, uh, which you have to live with at least in our model. Uh, and that means again that uh, land loss and migration in our model uh, basically appears in rural areas and uh, Belgium doesn't have uh, so rural coastal areas. Okay, thank you very much, Daniel. One of the things that we find on this is uh, Daniel responding to one question triggers a whole set of other questions and other people chipping in. Um, we can't really do this uh, online on, on this function, but I think we will capture all of those issues and I think um, we can always follow up with some questions. I'd like to just go to Esther now and answer, ask a, a forestry question. So, so we had a question from uh, Jorge Macho Azcarate who, who uh, was asking about um, the uh, forest burned areas and in Italy and, and how those are comparing to other parts of Southern Europe. Uh, and maybe you could say something about that for us. Um, yes, thanks a lot. Um, so actually, um, the, the spatial results I showed uh, were related to the, the change in biomass and the change in harvestable wood for forestry um, and for um, uh, actually burned areas. They are, um, uh, they, uh, I only showed uh, European wide results. However, um, it is true uh, uh, that there are differences across also the Mediterranean. Um, and I will try if I can very quickly show you 
if it's okay, you can sh see my screen now again. Um, and so this is a bit ad hoc, uh, but this figure 13 here, uh, it gives you the, um, the burned area in hectares. Um, and uh, this is actually a result of the FLAM model, so the biophysical model. Uh, there are two main uh, factors here, and we would have to do some sensitivity analysis to see actually which one is driving the results of the differences in burned areas in Southern Europe. You could indeed see that, especially in Portugal, this is much higher uh, than in uh, other Southern European countries. Uh, there are basically two main drivers behind this. The one is the suppression coefficient, as they call it. And this suppression coefficient uh, gives, uh, the, for example, the population density, uh, which in turn, uh, turn influences the amount of uh, forest fires. And the second coefficients are those uh, driven by climate uh, variables. Uh, so regional differentiations in radiation, temperature ch changes, or uh, precipitation amongst others. I hope that explains a bit. Yes, no, that does. Okay. Um, I'm aware of the time now and we have uh, um, many questions and I don't think it's uh, possible to go through them all. Um, what I think we should probably do is sort of come, we've been on now for one hour and 15 minutes. Um, I would perhaps now suggest that we um, call it a day and thank, you, you can't clap and thank our speakers, so I kind of have to do that. <laughs> but um, I sort of take it on your behalf, that's uh, okay. So what, what we will do is um, we will circulate the slides uh, from this to the participants and uh, I'll investigate what exactly we do with the questions but it's quite possible that we can um, put up some sort of generic replies or some specific replies to some of the questions that have been raised uh, and I think there's also an opportunity for you to connect with the individual researchers afterwards uh, and probably also follow up with direct emails if there's areas of interest so I think that's a, a fairly okay type of uh, promise to make to you all. Um, from my side, I would like to end by saying um, thank you enormously for joining us. We realise it's a really challenging time at the moment and also uh, thank you for giving up your time. I'd just maybe like to ask Francesco if you'd like to say anything just to close off for us. Um, uh, Francesco, I can see you yes. coming on. Yes, um, of course. So uh, let me just join the thanks to our speakers, the, the chairman and also all the participants. Um, we are glad to see so much, uh, so huge uh, participation to this, uh, to follow these uh, these themes in general, and in particular the our coach, uh, the coach work. Let let me just remind that uh, next uh, for May 14th we are going to have the second um, webinar related to coach results, which is going to focus more on. Uh, climate change impacts on labor productivity and energy production. So another another topic that is quite, uh, uh, at least uh, uh, in our opinion, quite interesting. So with this said, I will, uh, I would like to thank you again and uh, I'm waiting for you the next, uh, at the next, uh, next webinar. Bye bye. Thank you all.